I'm going to invite your attention to the word of the Lord in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to read the first four verses. We're very much mindful of, of the city in which we live and the nearness of the coming of the Lord. And we don't want people to be lost. And so we are here to try and persuade and to encourage and to beseech all that are unsafe that the Lord is soon to come and that time is really winding down. If you don't see that time is winding down, I'm going to pray that the Lord would open your eyes, that you would have an understanding that time here on earth is winding down. The scoffers in Peter's epistle, they said, well, everything continued as they were from the creation. Little did they know that um, time is really against us. And Jesus made mention of one of, in one of his messages about the days of the Anadoluvian world, that they were very much unaware of the disaster that was just around the corner. And he said, Jesus said, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. That's Jesus' words. And so we, got, we just have to be careful of the day in which we live. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his will. And my subject today is don't drift past the harbor. Don't drift past the harbor. And I'm going to ask you just to lift your hearts to God and let God talk with you and see where you are in light of God's word. And see that we can understand the time in which we live so that we can make a full assessment that we don't drift past the harbor. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are very grateful, Lord, to you, and we thank you for all of your loving kindness. Thank you, Lord, for your great work that you do not just in the universe, but what you do for our lives. And how, Lord, when we were destitute and in sin, in bondage, in the horrible pit of sin that you came by, you reached down your nails card hand, lifted us out, extricated us from such horrible place. And Lord, you have planted our feet upon solid rock. Yea, Lord, you've given us a song, song of your praise. Thank you for your providence. Lord, how you've watched over us from our early existence in life, even upon this time. Sometimes we're unaware of your presence. Nonetheless, Lord, you are mindful of us. We thank you. 
We thank you, O oh God, because you are you're such a wonderful God. The songwriter said, and while he was on the cross, then I was on his mind. And Lord, before we were brought forth, you knew us. For we were shaped, you knew us. David said, all our members were written in your book. And so we're thankful you told the disciples, very hair on your head is numbered. We thank you, O oh God, for all that you do. You superintend the black hole in outer space, the depths of outer space, but yet you're cognizant of where we are. And sometimes we're drifting on the sea of time and you come by and you lift us. You bring us to safety. Oh God. We're very grateful for all you do. I ask you today, Lord, to talk to us. Help us to be aware of the nearness of your coming and the severity of your judgment that awaits this world. I pray that your hand, oh God, your nail-scarred hand will always be resting upon us, Lord. It will help us, oh God, to, that we will be guided by your hand. Chart a course for us, Lord, and craft a life that, God, your glory will be seen. I pray that you would help us, Lord. Amen. I pray you would direct our hearts to love you and to serve you. Help us to know that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word, Lord, will never pass away. By it, you uphold the universe, and by it, you judge the world. Thank you for your eternal words, O oh God. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And yea, Lord, there are light unto our path. Give us light, Lord, in the time of darkness. And I pray that you'll help us. There may be people that are in this place going through tests and trials and troubles. Are perplexed, they're conf confused, they don't know what to do. Mighty God, Lamb of God, please to touch their hearts. And I pray that you'd help us, that when we shall have left here, Lord, we'll know that we have stood in your presence. Talk to us about eternity, Lord, and help us to know and help us to realize the danger of the hour. I pray that you'll touch the lips of clay. Oh, God, that what should be said would benefit some soul that had drifting past the harbor. Hallelujah. God, I pray that you'll hear thou from heaven. Perform and do. Let your eyes always be open to this place. And let your ears be attentive to the prayer that is made from this place. Hear thou from heaven. Perform, do, and pray. In Jesus' name and all the people said amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Please be seated. Brother Marvin Treese is an apostolic preacher, lived in Louisiana. He's subsequently gone on to be with the Lord. There are some portion in scripture that he has actually done some translation. And in his translation called the literal word, Verse 1 is read this way in our text. Here it's, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest seed to the things which we have heard. Will you pull that up for me in the New Living Text? Lest at any time we should let them slip and the new living text so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it and brother Treese's translation is this because of this it is necessary 
that we pay attention intently to the things which we have heard, lest we drift by the harbor or mooring. We do, we do not want to drift by the harbor. Because the harbor gives safety and protection. The harbor is a place of refuge from the storm. It's a place where you anchor, where ships are anchored. And as a consequence, then they are offered covering from the various storms. And so if you're anchored, if you're in the harbor, then you're going to be safe. When you pull from the harbor, you're exposed to all kinds of things that the weather will deliver. The harbor is where you go in order to get into the portals of glory. You want to be in the harbor. You want to safely reach the harbor. Life is like a boat on the sea and you want to reach the safety of the harbor. We don't want to drift from the harbor. I think every one of us in this room today want to make heaven their home. And in order to do that, you have to stay in the harbor and not be exposed to the elements that are so very unkind at times. And so the harbor then, we have to give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest we drift by the harbor. So we don't want to drift past the harbor. Please allow me to give you three reasons why we, why we must not drift past that harbor. Firstly, we have a superior salvation when we compare it to the Old Testament church in the wilderness or Old Testament Israel. You will notice that the writer here starts off almost in the middle of his thought. The therefore in chapter 2 here in our text really is looking back to chapter 1. I.e. in light of what he said in chapter 1. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed. And uh, the writer then in chapter 1 outlines to us the superiority of Jesus Christ over angels, over Moses. Jesus here then in chapter 1 is, is shown to be superior to angels. In as, in as much as he was a man on earth, he's superior. And the writer mentions seven things in chapter 1. Why Jesus was superior to angels. Number one, Jesus is said to have obtained a more excellent name. Verse 4. Number two. He will receive their worship. Jesus is going to receive angels' worship, so that means he's greater than angel. Number three, he made angels, verse 7. Number four, he is the one who sits on the throne, verse 8. Number five, he is the anointed, he is the one that is anointed above them, verse 9. Number six, he is the creator of the universe, he is immutable and eternal, verses 10, 11, and 12. And number seven, he has a higher place of honor, verse 13. 
And this, the superiority then of Jesus is also shown by seven things that point to his glory as a mediator. Seven things. First, he is not an angel, but he is designated as the son. Second, he is denominated as heir to all things. Third, he made the worlds. Fourth, he is called the brightness of God's glory. Fifth, he is the express image of God's person. Sixth, he is the one that has purged us from our sins. And seventh, he has finished the work and is on the right hand of majesty on high. So then, because he is the son of God, because he is the heir of all things, because he made the worlds, because he is the brightness of God's glory, because he is the express image of God's person, because he has purged our sins, because he has finished that work, and at the right hand of the throne of on high, therefore, the writer said, we must recognize that his message has a paramount claim on our attention, our belief, and our obedience. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, recognizing from who this message is coming. It's not coming from angels. It's not coming from Moses. It is not coming from anybody else. It is coming from Jesus. So therefore, we ought to pay attention. Notice, if you will, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus brings up the same kind of concept. In dealing and talking with Solomon, he said, the queen of the south, she shall rise up in judgment with this generation and she condemn it. Why? Because she came from the uttermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And notice what Jesus says, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So sometimes we have a greater judgment if we have a greater witness. We have a greater responsibility if we know more. So then having a greater witness will demand a greater and more severe judgment. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed. So Jesus' message then is superior to the message that any angel will bring. It is superior to what the Mosaic law had to say. The verb to pay attention, even as Brother Trees translated it, means not only to turn your mind to a thing, but also to act upon what one perceives from what they've heard. So when we've heard something, then we're responsible for what is, the content is. And when we therefore consider it in action, not taking any steps, not doing anything by what we have heard is just a fatal error. You are better off, I am better off in not knowing than having full knowledge of it, do nothing about it. What have we heard? We have heard the gospel of the grace of God. When, when the Lord allowed people to come to a service like this, it is because he wants them to hear a word. They don't just come here to see people in, in nice suits and great looking hats and great shoes and all of that thing. No, God is actually warning us, warning you, to hear a word so that you don't drift past the harbor. He is wanting you to hear a word that will cause you 
to make heaven your home that will cause you to enter the portals of glory. He is wanting you to understand that there is a message, a cogent message that is applicable to your life so that you can change. And the, the thing is so sure, the writer said in times past, God spoke to the fathers by various means. But in this time, at the very end of the world, he came himself. It is the apex of the revelation of God. And so he came and so his message, message is so precise. It is so clear, it is so, it is so without any ambiguity that we have to give earnest heed lest we pass the shore. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter and the day of Pentecost told people who were convicted in their heart, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That message is sure that message has no variation there is no substitute there is no corollaries there is no addendum there is no addition but that message is sure it is corroborated by other men God sanctioned it so everybody under heaven doesn't matter where they came from doesn't matter what their name is doesn't matter what their pedigree is doesn't matter what office they hold Everybody under the heaven must obey it. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed. See, sometimes God will give you a little latitude. But here, as we will see, God is making no provision for latitude other than the grace of God that brings salvation. Please note then... That you don't have to violently oppose to the message to suffer loss. One need only to drift away from it. Just to drift. The gospel is a moral remedy for a moral disease. Sin is not something you can go to CVS and get some kind of a, uh, a remedy for. There is no antidote in CVS. The pharmaceutical community don't have a remedy for sin. So God has given us a moral remedy in the gospel to address itself to your sin and my sin. We do well then to give them more earnest heed to those things that the Lord would speak. Lest we drift from the shore. Lest we drift from the harbor. Lest we drift from the place of safety. It is only by being believed that, that the gospel become efficacious. Unless people believe the word, it will have no effect. But the word of God when believe, it can change a drunkard. It can sober up a drunkard. They told me we, we baptized a man recently. He went down totally inebriated, drunk. When he came back out of the water, he was sober. The word of God is able to sober up a drunkard. When you believe the word. Isaiah said, who has believed the report? If you believe that God is able to take your life that is wasted now. Your life that has been brutalized by sin and ravished by the devil. God has a power and a, and a power that can turn you around. But you gotta believe, you gotta come. And know, as the songwriter said, there is wonder working power in the blood of Calvary. 
I know a fount where sins are washed away. And I know a place where burdens are lifted, blind eyes made to see there is wonder work in power, but you got to believe it. You got to be aware that God has a power to transform your life, to change your life. The Lord talked with one woman one time at the well, Jacob's well. And during the course of the conversation, Jesus made mention, he says, go call your husband. We want to do a Bible study. And the woman's answer, well, sir, I don't have a husband. He said, well, yeah, that, you, you're, you're, you're saying truth. You've had five husbands. Not just one. You've got, you have had five husbands. And the one you're living with, you're just shacking up. It's not your own. But Jesus said, I've got a solution. I'm not just going to point out your problem. I have a solution for you. You've been looking for somebody to, to validate you. But I'm here to tell you that I've got water. I've got a solution. I've got a power. I've got something that will go beyond the love of a man. I've got something that can transcend what man can. Your soul is thirsty for meaningful relationship. Well, I've got a solution for you. I know a place where sins are washed away. So when this thing is believed, when your affections are turned a place upon it, when your heart is bent towards what God is talking to you about, when, when your heart is inclined, when you bring your whole self, see sometimes people just want to bring part of them. God wants you to bring your whole self. Even if your feet are lame, bring your lame feet. Even if you've got pieces, bring everything that you still have left. And put them down at Jesus' feet. And he's a potter. And so God can do something for your life. But to hear it is not enough. There must be a personal appropriation of that which you've heard you've got to apply it you've got to make it become real doesn't have anything about your daddy to do about your daddy and your mom and your friend and your your best friend doesn't have anything but it has all to do what you hear give the most earnest heed to the thing that you have heard lest you drift past the harbor so he's holding us us that drifting there is a real danger secondly we have a more severe consequence verse 2 for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward we must recognize then the greatness of this salvation or we will drift past the harbor of safety. So the word of God is a place of safety where we can hide from all of the disasters of life. We can be anchored so that we won't drift. And I don't know how often you go on a boat. But every time that I've gone on a boat, even when we go fishing out in the Gulf, once they stop, they're going to drop an anchor. They're going to anchor or else you're going to drift. You're going to drift. You may not even realize that you're drifting, but you're going to drift. And so the word of God is a place of safety. And we can anchor in him. Songwriter said, I've anchored in Jesus. 
The storms of life are brave. I've anchored in Jesus. I'll fear no wind or wave. I've anchored in Jesus. I've anchored in the rock of ages. And so since an inferior law under Moses brought about such severe judgment, it only makes sense that a superior salvation in Christ Jesus has an attendant greater judgment. Notice, he says, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Now I'm going to show you this. He says, every transgression and disobedience. Now, these are both violations of God's word. They are really both disobedience, but there's a difference. Every transgression, this literally is translated, it really means this. It is a stepping around. That is, there is a stepping around the word of God, which causes some people to indulge in some things that are contrary to the will of God. How do they explain it? They're stepping around it. There are some people who do things and they, they, they never feel like God will see. So God is too busy. Then the disobedience. This one has a more subtle form of listening around. So there's the stepping around and then there is the listening around the word of God. And you say, well, how can they listen around? Well, in this class, you have people who are dismissing the word of God as having relevance only to the culture to which it was written. Only to the biblical times. Or they sometimes read into it personal opinions. So they say, oh, you know, what was written in the, in the New Testament and, and in the Acts of the Apostles, oh, that was for the old church. I mean, I hear people say, well, that was for the old church. That means in 2013 in North America, that's not really applicable to us. What, what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, oh, that was for the, the old church. No, no, that's for the old backslidden church who didn't, who didn't have sense. Really? They're listening around. But, but you need to understand... So although this, the plain teaching of the word of God, I've got people reading Acts 2.38. They read it with their own mouth and eyes. But they're listening around. It's all oh, well. Yeah, we, we know Peter did that. But you know, Peter was a backslider. He really wasn't sensible. But now we got sense. We, we got such great knowledge. God has opened our understanding. So we don't have to do that. They're listening around. So although the plain teaching of the word of God is there, but because it conflict with their nature, with their flesh, it conflict with their tradition, it conflict with, with what they were brought up in. Because there's a conflict, then they excuse themselves by using these methods of stepping around and listening around. The word of God. But make no, no mistake about it. We have to give them more earnest heed. To the things we have heard. Lest at any time. We let them slip. Under Moses' law. There was one man that was. Found to be gathering sticks. If you pull up Numbers chapter 15. From verse 33. And, and they that found him 
gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and to Aaron and unto all the congregation. Verse 34. And they put him in a ward because it was not declared what they should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Verse 36. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. We should understand then that here was Moses' law. Given under the disposition of angels that one man contravened one precept and it cost him his life. They stoned him to death. So that God is, that, that God back there is the same God today. You remember that the, the, in, in Acts chapter 5, in one day, we had two deaths in the church. Ananias and Sapphira died within three hours of each other. And some people think, well, God is more tolerant to sin today than back then. Well, here is, here is what we need to consider. Could it be that our cups are simply filling up? Sometimes God will execute judgment, but other times he just give us space for grace and our cups are just filling up. Just because God is not saying anything doesn't mean that we're getting away with it. He, the cups are just filling up until judgment hit. It doesn't mean that God is going to excuse sin. God is consistent and just. And if he judged the people down in any place, he would have to go back and apologize to them if he didn't do the same to us. And the one thing God has seen about God, he really doesn't apologize to anybody. He's consistent. So we need to know that there is a severe judgment. Thirdly, disaster is threatened by mere neglect. How shall we escape if we ne neglect? Remember, it says simply neglect now. Doesn't mean that we're committing some gross sin. It's just neglect. I think it's quite sobering to see that disaster now is threatened, is brought on by nothing more than neglecting. This, that means it is not necessary to disobey any specific injunction or command. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape what? How shall we escape if, if we neglect? What are we escaping? It's hell we're going to escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That means if we neglect the salvation, hell could be our portion. That is why it is so scary to know that just neglecting what you've heard, what you know, can send you to hell. I understand we don't preach it like we do in Bible times. Because if you look at most pulpit today, they don't even talk about sin or hell. It's all about how your bank account is going to be enriched if you do so. And if you did this and how you're going to be good if you did that. The Bible is not about that. The Bible is about heaven and hell and escaping hell. That's what the Bible is about. It's about dealing with our sins. It's about dealing with our problems. It's about getting right to meet God. That's what the Bible is about. It's not about how we can enrich ourselves. Jesus Christ came here and the Bible said he didn't own anything. So it's not about being wealthy. That's what now, now preachers today will make you feel like it's all about that, but it's not. It is how do we escape hell? I look at the world and they feel like they can pick and choose what they believe based on their taste. 
They, 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 it's like you go down to Golden Corral and they've got a buffet line and you, you pick what you want. When you serve God, it's not like a buffet line, friend. I mean, our world make you feel like it's like a buffet. So you've got, you've got Catholics, you've got Presbyterian, you've got Church of God, you've got Moravian, you've got Episcopalian, you've got Church of God, you've got Wesleyan, you've got Baptist, you've got all kind of stuff. And they will make you feel like you can pick anyone you want and go to heaven. It's a lie from the devil. It's just a lie that the devil want to get people in hell. You can't pick and choose. This is not a religious buffet line. People are going to be in for a rude awakening. When they come up before God. Because God has only one church. He knows only one way. The Bible said one Lord, one faith, one ba He only knows one thing. So the devil has deceived people into feeling like they can be church of God. Baptist, Moravian. Well, no, not, not if you're going to heaven. Hallelujah. If you want to stay on earth, that's fine. But if you plan to go to heaven, you got to get in the Bible. Oh, Lord, have mercy. you got to get in the Bible way. You have to be part of the church of the living God. Woo, Holy Ghost. Pull up Hebrews 12, 22 for me, please. But you are come unto Mount Zion. And I come to some confessional booth. Then I come to sit on some mourner's bench. No, no, no. But you are come to Mount Zion. It's a heavenly setting. Unto the city of the living God. To the heavenly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. Which are written in heaven. They're not just on some man's book. In heaven and to the God the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Unto the Jesus Christ the mediator. Of the new covenant. So this is not just a. A little place where you go to feel good. Where you go to ease your conscience. This is a place where you go and the Holy Ghost is going back and forth. This is a place you go where God is said to be walking in and out. Hallelujah. It has nothing to do with men's proclivity to do all kind of foolishness. No, this is why being apostolic, you come to an altar to meet with God. You don't go to there and meet, the, meet with a, peri, a priest. When you come to an altar, it's God and you. That's a place where God started to deal with you. Where your heart is exposed to the searing heat of God's word. And David said, turn your searchlight and see if there's, you see some, some wicked thing in me and then cleanse me. This is not a place where you sit on a mourner's bench. And you see a few Hail Mary and you, you do all kind of stuff. No, this is a place where you come and you see yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When those priests came to the laver of water, at the bottom of the laver were looking glasses. And so as they approached this laver of water, they could see themselves. They could see themselves. Because many times we forget what we look like. Until we get again before the mirror. Well, when you approach God, he's going to show you that you see yourself. You're a liar. You're a thief. You're uncondemned. You're a crack. You're a fornicator. God word, let us see ourselves, And then we know we need a cleanse. We need a washing. We need God to deal with us. 
Hallelujah. And so the point said, I came to Jesus as I was. Jesus don't need for you to do anything. Just bring yourself. I came to Jesus as I was weary and sick with sin. Hallelujah. When you come to the Lord, friend, you just need to know that however you come, God is able to deal with you. There is not a problem that you can bring to the Lord that he won't fix it. So songwriter said, fix me, Jesus. Fix me. When you come, fix me, Jesus. I can't pray till you fix me right. I can't sing till you fix me right. Fix me. So Jesus is a fixer. Hallelujah. So we have come to a place where God is what work. Hallelujah. So it's not just being a, a religious worshiper. You've got to come to a place where God can fix you. Paul calls it the church of the living God. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. But if I tarry long that you might as know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. So there's a, there's a way you got to behave. Oh Lord have mercy. There's a way you have to live. There's a way you have to talk. You, you can't just come up in here and, and feel like you're just going to some other church. No, no, no. When you come here, you, there's a fear of God here. Why? Which is, he said now, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. That's why we're not, we're not like other secular churches. People sometimes take umbrage at that. But we're not like other churches. We're just not like that. We born at an altar. God touch our heart. There was a conversion. It's a conversion. We didn't just shake a preacher's hand. They didn't just write our name on a roll. No, we met with Jesus and, and Jesus performed a spiritual surgery. Wash our sin. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. This is real church. Is this the real church? Yeah. This is the real church, friend. You don't have to go anywhere else. This is the real church. This is where if God come back to Tampa, this is where he's going to pull up. It's the church of the real. This is the real church. Real church. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Observe, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's why we're baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Why? Jesus purchased us with his own blood. His own blood. That's why we're baptized in his name. Because we belong to him. We're not trying to listen around the word of God. If the word of God said baptize in Jesus name, that's what we're going to do. That's what the apostle did. That's what they did at Acts 2.38. That's what they did in Acts chapter 9. That's what they did in Acts chapter 10. This is what they did in Acts chapter 8. This is what they did in Acts chapter 19. That's how you get baptized. We're not going to try and listen around the word. Are simply going to comply. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, you will see that the can, people continue praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord, notice the Lord added to the church daily such as to be saved. 
How were they added? According to Acts 2 and 38, people repent. We were baptized in Jesus' name. Got the Holy Ghost. That's how you're added to the church. Now, friend, have you been added to the church? Have you been added that way? If you haven't been added that way, then God is saying you have to give the more earnest heed to the things that you have heard and is hearing today lest you drift past the harbor. Lest you lose out with God. Oh, Holy Ghost. And the thing, the thing which is so serious that the writer brings to our attention He lists at least three reasons why we got to pay real close attention. Verse three. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first, number one, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, not by Gabriel. You know, it's not even by John the Baptist. But the Lord spoke it himself. He adds a dignity. He adds a veracity to what is spoken. He spent three and a half years show, showing people that he was going to die and pay the price for sins, sin's price and that he would redeem mankind. He used scriptures. Look, look in, 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 in um, Luke chapter 24. If you will, you'll pull that up. Verse 25. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow, hard to believe. This is those folks on the Emmaus road after Jesus had been raised. So of hard and slow to believe all of that the prophets have spoken. Verse 25. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them. In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So God is going to use all of the scriptures. Drop down to verse 45. Same, same, same chapter. Verse 45. The Bible said, then open he their understanding. We want people's understanding to be open. That they might understand the scripture. Verse 46. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, not anybody else's name. Not in the triune, not in, in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witness of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. That, that, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And the Bible said he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hand and blessed them. Friend, you want to get to a place where God can open your understanding so that you might see the word of God because you hear it. And he said you've got to give the most earnest heed to the things that you have heard lest you drift past the harbor. It's a serious thing to be lost. Eternity is a very long time. Hell is a terrible place to be. Jesus said more about hell and not going to hell than he did about heaven. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here. So Jesus began to talk about it. That means it's serious business. Second, said it and 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 it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him so when the apostles started to preach what jesus taught them and said to them don't you think that you're gonna so people gonna you know they get so so religious and so holy well we're not we're not gonna believe what peter said we we'll believe what jesus said let me just remind you that Jesus hadn't written anything in the New Testament. Well, is that? well, it's in red. Let me remind you that Jesus didn't write anything in the New Testament. There's only one place we heard where Jesus stooped down and write. And he wrote on the ground. 
and that's long ago been washed away. So Jesus didn't write anything in the New Testament. You know, and people don't know that. They thought Jesus went ahead and wrote that. Well, he didn't. You need to understand that we only believe on Jesus by the apostles' word. Hallelujah. That's, all, the only, that's the only way we believe. What we know about God is what Peter told us, what Paul told us, what Philip told us, what Matthew told us. That's all we know. We are over 2,000 years removed from Jesus' flesh. During the days of his flesh, so we never shook Jesus' hand. We never sat down with him. We believe on Jesus based on what the apostle told us. So don't you, don't you dare say you're going to believe what Jesus said and not what Peter did. I'm going to believe what Jesus said. You need to believe on Christ like Peter tells you to believe. And Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how you believe on Jesus. So it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Peter heard him. Peter conferred. Peter preached. And so there is, listen, there is nobody going to heaven. In this church age, unless they believe what Peter preached. None. I don't, I don't care what they have. I don't care what they title. If they don't believe what Peter preached, hell is going to be their portion. Peter, people thought, well, God is merciful. Yeah, he's merciful based on Acts 2.38. That's where his mercy is demonstrated. That's why you need to believe it. That's where his mercy is at. If you try listening around that, you're going to be, you're going to be lost. So when we look then, it said it was confirmed unto us by them that heard it. This, this means that there has been no alteration, but that which is said to us, that which is preached to us, is genuine. It was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. There's no intermediary there. There's no place for error. They heard him and they confirmed it to us. Friend, if you have something that you can't read in the scripture, you better give the most earnest heed to what you're hearing today, lest you drift past the harbor. This verb confirmed is, is really used as a legal technical term that means to designate properly guaranteed security. And in the context of what we have read, it means the saving message was guaranteed to us. This message that we have here, this Acts 2.38 message, people sometimes turn up their nose, but I bet you when you go up before God, this is exactly what he's going to open for you to read. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't get saved, that's what you're going to read. So the message that Jesus is offering is guaranteed by the apostolic attestation. The apostles got it from the Lord. They preach it. We received it. If we receive it, we could say, Lord, we got what you gave to the apostles. Hallelujah. The thing about us, what we have, even if someone said, you don't need all of that, we have enough gas to take us to heaven. We got more than enough gas to take us to heaven, so to speak. But suppose you don't get it and you really need it. That means you're going to run out of gas before you hit heaven. That's dangerous. So you're better off having it and not needing it than needing it and not having it. And the third thing is that God himself confirm it. Verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. So God himself 
didn't leave those apostles without the the attestation of his power he didn't leave them with an empty thing he got gave them a message and then they worked with him he worked with them the bible says lo i'm with you all the way to the end of the world and again the bible said god working with them and brought forth various things what is god doing he is letting people know that what the apostles were preaching is genuine that's the bona fide thing that's the real thing Hallelujah. He gave them signs to attest to the truth of their message. The gospel, you see, is, is no human creation because really, if it was of a human origin, people would make it so easy to get to heaven as they're trying to do now. Paul calls it God's gospel in Romans chapter 15, verse 16. This thing, friend, is a message that comes from the heart of God. And it's a message that everybody on earth is going to have to obey. And so the writer said, therefore we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Lest at any time we let them slip. And I've talked to several people recently. And I'm going to mention this to you today. The greatest example that we have of people hearing the word of God and letting it slip, hearing the word of God and not paying attention to it, hearing the word of God and had no effect upon them. The greatest example we had was Judas. I want you to think about it. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. Judas spent about three and a half years with the Lord. He ended up committing suicide and waits the day of judgment. Think about all of the messages that Judas heard. During those three and a half years, think about all the messages that Jesus gave. Think about all the miracles that Judas saw. He himself went out and healed. Think about all the atmosphere that Judas enjoyed. And yet, he ended up lost. Why? Let us therefore give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Lest at any time we let them slip. We, 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 can't, we cannot make an argument to say, well, Judas lost his way because he didn't really have someone capable to teach him. Or somebody capable to preach to him. Or somebody capable to warn him or have compassion in him or show him mercy. We can't make an argument to say, well, if Moses was Judas' pastor, then he would have made heaven. We can't make that argument. Jesus is by all, by, by, by any stretch of the imagination, the best teacher, the best preacher. He had more compassion. He demonstrated more mercy. He knew what was in Judas. He called him friend, but yet he spent three and a half years with Jesus and never made heaven. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Did Judas hear about being right? I think so. Those, those other 11 men made it into heaven. Judas awaits the judgment. I want you to think about that.
The reason why Judas missed out is because he did not contemplate on what he heard. I want you to, con if you're not saved, if you have not been baptized in Jesus name, I do not want you to leave here without you going down in Jesus name because you've heard it. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things that you have heard, lest at any time they will slip or you drift past the harbor. Let the word of God anchor your heart, anchor your soul. Let the word of God bring you to the portals of glory. Let the word of God usher you into heaven. We can stand, I'm done. Friend, I don't know what you're thinking. But if I were you, if I wasn't saved, I would start searching myself. Is God going to allow me to be a Judas? I hope not. I pray, I pray there's never a Judas here that hear the word and end up being lost. Because you couldn't, you couldn't make a case that you didn't hear the word. I'm going to ask you to pull up that song for me. Oh, to be like thee. The sure way of not drifting past the harbor is to look at Jesus. He is held up before us as greater than angel, greater than Moses, greater than the law. And as we hold it up, We want to be like Jesus. Now I want you. I want you. We're going to sing this song. But I, I want everyone in here. To, to really say it. As a prayer. Verse 1. I want to put up verse 1. I want us to say that. And I want the whole, the whole congregation, and one, once you start say, saying it, I want you to forget about who is beside you. And I want you to say it as a prayer to God. And so here we go. Let's, 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 let's read it together before we sing it. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Pull up verse 3 for me. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit. Holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring, cruel reproaches, willing to suffer, others to save. Verse 4, oh to be like thee, Lord I am coming. Now to receive the anointing divine. All that I am and have I am bringing. Lord, from this moment, all shall be healed of Oh, to be like thee, verse 5. While I am pleading. Pour out thy spirit, fill with thy love. Make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling, and fit me for life and heaven above. And then the chorus, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. 
Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. We want God to help us. Oh, to be like thee, Lord. Lord, I don't want to listen around your word. I don't want to be talk, trying to go around your word. But I, I want you to come, Lord, and stamp your own image deep on my heart. I want you to move me from where I am, Lord, from lethargy. Move me from complacency. Move me from just being filled with myself. Move me from just thinking about how great I am, how wonderful. Move me. Oh, to be like me, Lord, I am coming. Now to receive the anointed, all that I have, and Lord, I'm bringing. Lord, from this moment, all is going to be yours. I want to hit the portals of heaven. I, want, I don't want to drift from the harbor. I don't, I don't want to be lost. Judas spent so many years with Jesus, and yet... He ended up lost. Lord, I don't want that. I want to pay earnest heed to the thing that I've heard. Lord, I want you to move me. I want you to help me. I want to hear well done in that day.